Welcome. Um, we are going to get started in just a moment. We are going to have this amazing com uh, conversation and presentation on metaphor, coaching through a generative metaphor framing process for sense making. So if you are here for another webinar, you might want to double check your schedule. But if you're here to learn about metaphor, you're in the right spot. Um, we're going to give it another minute or two. And if you are here and would like to turn your camera on, we'd love to see you, but you don't have to. I know for some this might be lunch hour, so feel free to keep it off. Um, we've also noticed that Zoom decided that it would like to include closed captions in this particular session, and we're not sure about why it's doing that. So if you see words on the bottom of the screen, Zoom has just decided to turn that on, um, and hopefully that won't be a distraction. Um, and again, I want to welcome you. I see some familiar faces. We've been in seminars um, the last couple days. Glad to see some of those uh, return folks. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, Richard, why don't you mind? Um, why don't you stop your screen share just for a moment, just so sure. I can see everybody while I do the intro, and then I can have you come back on. Um, you know, this is a session that is eligible for ICF CEUs. Um, it's 1.5, and this is in court competency. We will be tracking attendance at the beginning and the end, and live attendance is required to receive your CEU. Those will be issued to the fielding um, registrar's office, and you'll want to give it at least three to five weeks to receive that via email. And let me introduce myself, and then I'm going to introduce the speaker. I'm Dr. Carrie Arnold. I'm the Program Director for Evidence-Based Coaching here at Fielding Graduate University. I'm delighted to host a series of seminars this week um, in our first alumni week that's been able to attract audience from all over the world since we're doing this virtually. I wish we could be in person, but I'm delighted that you guys are joining and calling in. So let me um, introduce you now to our speaker. Jim and I, or not Jim, um, Richard and I have been talking off and on about him presenting. And as a coach, I love using metaphor. And I think it's a powerful awareness tool, a powerful sense-making tool. And so I'm really excited to listen to your conversation and your presentation, Richard. Um, a little bit about Richard. He is a Fielding graduate. He got his PhD at Fielding, and he is also a graduate of the Evidence-Based Coaching Program. And he's an adjunct professor at Valley College. He teaches business, leadership, and change management courses. And he's currently designing a metaphor, a coaching, uh, a metaphor coaching model. And so I think we're going to be exposed to some, you know, maybe some original thought here. He also holds a professional certified coach with the International Coach Federation. And I'm excited to turn the um, microphone over to you. Thank you. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to share. So I guess the process of this conversation is to really introduce the background of my PhD study and how I kind of combine two different theories. Uh, one is by uh, Schoen, which is uh, generative metaphor theory, and then Bateson's work on framing theory, and how I was able to bring those two different uh, theories together through the lens of metaphors. And out of that came a coaching process that has some unexpected findings but also shows how metaphor is used by coaches, but how bringing those two different theories can really create change within a client. Uh, not just change, but really the sense-making change. So that's kind of a high level. Then we'll have opportunity for questions. And in this slide deck, I don't have the research or as far as the literature review, I have a separate PDF that has all of the theory and research that brings that together. And you can basically, you know, ask for that and I'll email that to you at the end or outside of the uh, session. So do we want to start? I'm ready. I think you're on mute. Let me, let me do the share screen. I was just going to say, go ahead. Share <laughs> that's your screen. Our, <laughs> I know that's, that's our latest. Yeah. You're on mute, right? <laughs> All right, so I think we do have this closed caption. So if you can't hear me or 
I guess, you know, tired of hearing me, you can read it down below. So, <clears throat> all right. So as the topic is metaphor coaching through a generative metaphor framing process for sense making. As far as the introduction, the dominant coaching narrative that I saw or that is still maybe prevalent is focused on goals, which is really no longer viable in a world that is uh, filled with uncertainty and ambiguity. I propose a new narrative that transcends goal-driven models and techniques using a metaphor-focused process. And with that background, this new narrative is found in the research uh, findings that I created using what I call a generative metaphor framing process. As far as the background to my study, it, it really flowed from my coaching of leaders who were undergoing a business challenge. In the coaching sessions, I attempted to guide leaders to design action plans and goals uh, to really try to solve their problem or their challenge that they were encountering. Um, but really what I observed was there was an, an really didn't work as well because what I picked up is there was deep and intense emotional reactions, uh, whether words they used or body language. So learning from my e, you know, EBC background from fielding is really reflecting after each coaching session. So as I began to journal that and see that and really kind of reflect on my sessions, I, I began to pick up on a pattern that there was really figurative phrases that these clients were using such as um, in quicksand and not able to get out. I feel like there's a heavy weight on my back and I'm trying to carry it around. So after researching the literature, I found uh, that really these linguistic expressions, they identify figurative language, which is mostly used as a metaphor or an image. They're, they're really the way we as humans kind of help us make sense of something by using an image to really show how we feel about something or how we're seeing something that we're in. As far as the you know, significance of the study, it was really an analysis of Schoen's theory of generative metaphor and Bateson's theory of framing. I propose there really was a synergy between these two different theories that can create new possibilities, perspectives, and actions. However, with the numerous studies on metaphors by psychologists, linguistics, psychotherapists, the literature had limited number of studies using metaphor really as a coaching process. And I think what, what helped me and informed me within my research was that metaphors are used heavily within psychotherapy I talk a lot about that in my literature review. And what I drew from that is that even some of the studies use generative metaphor, Schoen's work as a theory. And I said, well, this could be applied to coaching. As I went further down, specifically, there's no research to date that combines Schoen's theory of generative metaphor and Bateson's theory of framing as a coaching process for sense-making. And that's really was the catalyst for my research is to apply this to the coaching uh, world. The essence of the study sought to determine how the synergy between generative metaphor and framing could be used as a coaching process to really facilitate a new reality. And you'll hear that a lot within my research. And metaphors themselves have an imaginative way for us to see things differently. And we also use them to help us make sense of something, but they're really only one slice of reality, but they actually help us to imagine a new reality. And by drawing upon metaphors, we use metaphors to help us try to make sense of what is going on when we're confronted with a challenge or an opportunity, because that particular challenge or opportunity brings about ambiguity, uncertainty, 
and it sort of helps us kind of look at it differently through a different lens. As far as for the research, the theoretical framework of the study, it drew from Schoen's theory of generative metaphor, Basin's theory of framing, and also the essence of coaching is really based on social construct theory. And I'll go about that a little further down. But let's take a look at Schoen's metaphor theory and why this is different than coaches say, I use metaphors. This is a very specific type of metaphor and how Schoen looked at metaphors uh, from his perspective and how I took that theory. And that was the essence or really the grounding of not just using metaphors like something else or uh, just focusing on metaphors, but really the images that metaphors create. So really Schoen's theory contends the interpretation and understanding of experience, our lived experiences that we encounter are a hermeneutical problem whereby generative metaphor is a heuristic tool of analysis. Schoen called this process metaphorizing, the facilitation of a known image into a new unknown image. The example that Schoen used to start his uh, process of generative metaphor, he was working in an organizational process of engineers who were trying to create a particular product as far as painting. They were trying to paint uh, cars, I believe it was. And they were struggling because the paint would come out in little blobs and it wasn't adhering. And somebody said, well, this is like a paintbrush. And just that new image allowed them to create a particular process, a device that would really use the paint in a, in a way like a paintbrush does, but it wasn't. But that image really allowed them to look at their situation, their challenge differently, and to imagine new possibilities new perspectives that they had not seen before. So the essence of my process takes a known image, and we'll talk about it later what that means, into an unknown image that has not been seen before. As we look at Bateson's theory of framing, Bateson can really consider frames as structures that include or exclude and evaluate messages contained in the frame. Bateson called this abduction. As an activity, it seeks to recognize the patterns between different things. Bateson shows how metaphors are critical to the unity ecology of a mind, which can evoke reality for sense making. So, framing and reframing is used heavily in coaching. I've used it prior to using metaphors, but metaphors themselves are a frame. So, there's a synergy between Bateson's work and Schoen's work is that a metaphor is a frame and frame is also a metaphor. So that's where the synergy, that's where the intersection comes is by using metaphors, they become a frame within themselves. As we look at social construction theory, I, I basically came up with this idea of this co-creative dialogue. There, there's really a dialogue within coaching. It's dialectic in the sense that Clients and coaches open and have that open dialogue. And it was important to my study because really the underlying concept within my process is that metaphors can be both identified if the client offers a metaphor, but they also can be developed in the coaching relationship. And I'll talk about later as far as two different sides of that coin is that there are either client generated only metaphors that a coach would use, or there are metaphors offered by the coach only. And I said, there's probably a middle way. And that middle way is really through that co-creative dialogue. Social construction theory also underscores how, uh, how co-creative dialogue plays a role in the intersubjective sense making between the coach and client for interpreting experiences. What I mean by this is that on one level, the coach is also making sense of what the client is trying to make sense of their sense making. So there's this intersubjective, each 
within that social construct, that dialogue, both parties are creating sense making. As far as the research study, the study drew on the synergy between Schoen's gender to metaphor theory and Bateson's theory of framing to research how a generative metaphor framing process could help a coaching client reframe the uncertainty and ambiguity of their business challenge for sense making. And this really was the catalyst to help me understand going back to the background to start the study was that I was trying to create or design a goal driven or a process, but focusing on the goal did not achieve really where I think the, the essence or the gap that was between myself and my clients was that sense making, they first had to make sense of what was going on in order for them to take that next step, even to actually create a goal. The study itself explored the research question. So the research question in the study was how do leaders interpret their business challenge through a generative metaphor framing process? Two interviews were analyzed. I used IPA for eight leader participants. And based on the findings, they resulted in four superordinate themes. There was a shift in perspective. There was a change in affect or feeling of each of the participants. They each had a new self-awareness of their business challenge. And they also had a new perception I go more in detail later on the new perception because that was an unexpected finding that I had no idea that would uh, really come out of the process. So let's first look at the shift in perspective. There was a shift in perspective for each participant as they could envision a new reality of, of what was not available to them before developing a, a generative metaphor. The generative metaphor connected retrospectively and prospectively to cues that interpreted their challenge through the frame of imagination to evoke a new reality. I wanna offer this aspect, and you'll see this a lot through the next slides, is what I mean by really connecting retrospectively and prospectively. Sense-making itself, as articulated by Carl Weeks, is that sense making is an ongoing process that we as humans look retrospectively to past experiences in our unconscious. And we then look for another cue or pattern prospectively to connect that in order to help us make sense of what we're going through. Well, in the literature, metaphors themselves also offer a means to retrospectively and prospectively to connect the cues or patterns that we do not see. And by connecting those patterns, we go back to Bateson's theory is that's what we do as humans in order to connect what is around us, whether unconsciously or consciously. Now, metaphors themselves using generative metaphor creates the means of imagination. And so a metaphor itself can be at one sense retrospective, but also prospective because imagination is a prospective frame that we look through. So imagination allows us to look at a challenge or a problem or opportunity in a new reality. We can imagine it differently. We can see it differently, which also allows us to feel it differently. And by seeing or feeling it differently, it allows us to create sense-making to understand what may be going on. The next theme that occurred across all eight of the participants was a change in their affect. Participants in this theme created a change in their affect with their business challenges, uncertainty, and ambiguity by connecting retrospectively and prospectively to cues. The generative metaphor had changed in affect across the participants by interpreting their business challenge differently through an imaginative frame for a new reality. The third theme was a new self-awareness. All participants created a new self-awareness regarding their business challenges, uncertainty and ambiguity upon being invited into a generative metaphor framing process. The process created choice 
and change for a new reality by connecting to cues prospectively and retrospectively through an imaginative frame of reality for sense making. The fourth theme was the new perception. The new perception was identified in the second interview based on this question. What are your head, heart, and gut sensing with your challenge now? Each of the participants used descriptive phrases represented by a sense of connection, sensing a total body thing, a sense of alignment, a sense of wholeness, a sense of peace, a sense of balance, and a sense of completeness. Now, this was different than asking that same question in the first interview. And just to add a little bit of this, there was a gap of about four to six weeks between the first interview and the second interview. And the first interview, I asked, where in your head, heart, or gut are you sensing this challenge? Some would say, my heart is heavy. I feel my head is filled with uh, all this information. I feel sort of out of balance, distorted, whatever it may be. There was these phrases that was not showing this alignment or this balance that was picked up in the second interview. And that really led to a lot further research, even though it was outside of the scope of the study uh, I found it very fascinating that there was an actual shift somatically that was picked up in their perception after going through the generative metaphor framing process. They actually saw and felt themselves or saw this perception differently within their body. These uh, descriptive phrases imply an internal sense of disconnection before using the generative metaphor meaning there was a misalignment between their head, heart, and gut leading to a distortion of their perception. The head, heart, and gut questions appear to signal each participant was seeking a new state of alignment between their head, heart, and gut for sense-making. So when, when really confronted by a challenge, I propose, and what this finding suggests, is that there is a misalignment that we know something is not right, and we tend to look for cues, whether retrospectively from our past experience, our lived experiences, or we seek retrospect, I mean, prospective cues in order to help us make sense. And so this shows that the body, there's, there's sort of this misalignment between the head, heart, and gut. The uh, new perception in this unexpected finding implies by connecting to cues both prospectively and retrospectively for sense making, which is observed within the head, heart, and gut. A more in depth analysis of the head, heart, and gut, even though it was outside of the study scope, literature points to the head, heart, and gut functioning as three independent brains. And this is where neuroscience comes in, and I'm going to go into it next. So we basically possess three brains scientifically, even though we have one brain within our head. These are defined as the cephalic brain, which is our head, the cardiac brain, which is the heart, and the enteric brain, which is our gut, which, with each having complex neural networks capable of storing and processing information. Examples would be people say, I feel it in my heart is heavy, or I sense this in my heart, my heart is aching, or my gut senses something here. That's where the brain from our head brain is connected. And this is where this whole integrative uh, coaching or integrative connection between the head, heart, and gut is our body and head are connected. And that's really what informed me was really something unique within this study. So this finding implies that the head, heart, and gut brains can shift the inner sense of disharmony with a generative metaphor by reharmonizing perception for sense-making. The new perception sensed through the head, heart, and gut conveys an application for coaching practitioners in using a generative metaphor framing process for clients. The head, heart, and gut use that as, as an integrative model by the coach can help a coach and client reframe a challenge, creating an alignment of new perception for sense-making.
if we look at the implications of this study, the literature on coaching with metaphors suggests two main approaches of client generated or coach generated, which I mentioned before. However, the findings reveal that the iterative, that the iterative activity of co-creative dialogue between the coach and coaching client can develop a generative metaphor to evoke a new reality does not, that does not influence nor diminish the sensitivity and balance between the coach and coaching client. Just to kind of add more detail to this, within a client generated, there, there are models out there that only says that you could pick up and use what the client is offering as a metaphor. And there's research around that. There's also ones that show the, the coach generated where the coach only offers the metaphor. And to me, this sort of limits the ability for sense making to really manifest itself because within the coaching process that I created, me as the coach can offer just suggesting being curious using an ICF approach by just offering a metaphor. It may work, it may not work, but if it picks up with the client, that's the beginning stage of the process of first identifying back to Schoen's work is what's that first known image? What's the initial image that somebody uses? Then by using the generative metaphor process, you change that and offer, and then you co-create a new metaphor. Sometimes they actually create a new metaphor or you work with the client in order to create a new image. And it's that second image is what shifted and created the four themes within this uh, research that identified where the client was, how they solved their particular challenge through one particular image. And by changing the image to a new image, which is generative within itself, it was able to frame that challenge through an imaginative lens and a, really, really an alternative lens that they had not seen before. Coaching therefore only with a client generated or coach generated metaphor approach, I propose limits the sense making capacity for coaching clients. The restrictions of these two approaches overlook the iterative activity of co-creative dialogue for what is called frame flexibility. By envisioning the uncertainty and ambiguity of a business challenge through an imaginative frame for sense making. As far as a contribution to the literature, the findings show how a generative metaphor framing process provides the coaching client with the frame flexibility to restructure their challenges, uncertainty and ambiguity through an alternative frame of imagination to evoke a new reality for sense making. Because of that process in creating the sense making, this new reality that has been created through this imaginative lens can then lead to alternative decisions, solutions, and actions that can be used to solve their challenge, not otherwise seen before. So in essence, what this means is it goes back to the background of my study is that instead of going right at the goal design process from the start, I went upstream. If we consider a river, I've gone upstream and said, hmm, what if we allow them to see and feel their particular challenge differently and imagine it differently, then they can look and create solutions or decisions they had not even you know, really seen before. So now they have new possibilities, new perspectives, and new understanding that they had not known. As far as one magic question that really resonated within the study, that every, that every single participant was able to create a metaphor with was if you could paint a picture of how this challenge looks like for you now, what image would you paint? And that was unique because each person kind of paused and would reflect. Now, some people say, well, I, I'm not creative or I'm not uh, you know, left brain, some one, one person used. And so by using that co-creative process is even at this point, just offering, well, I would say, if you could paint this picture and it's, oh, no, that's not it. That happened about three out of the eight participants 
that was the catalyst. So this is where that co-creative process as a coach, just by suggesting, instead of just going with what the client says, because there are some individuals who may not be able to tap into that creative process to create an image, but by offering that or as a catalyst, it doesn't mean you stay with that particular image, but that was a catalyst to open up that dialogue and they were able to create a image initially, which then led to the second image that we co-created together. As far as the coaching process itself, it in really in essence, instead of just using framing as a technique, the generative metaphor framing process changes both the frame and the picture inside of a challenge to help a client evoke a new reality for sense making. So in essence, what I've done here is this, this research shows that the frame itself changes and the picture inside the frame changes. Framing as a technique only changes the frame that someone looks at the same picture. Sometimes if we just change the picture, we don't have a frame around the picture. So in essence, we're creating both a new frame and a new picture. I think that's it. Wow, that went faster than I thought. <laughs> I am here. So thank you for the opportunity and uh, we're gonna open it up for questions. I have a question, um, Richard. Yes. First of all, thank you. That's really impressive work. And I'm really interested in how you um, combined Batesman and generative uh, metaphors. It's really interesting. So thank you again. <laughs> Um, but so how, how would I invite more metaphor use into my coaching sessions? How would I use this practically? Yeah, that's a great question. So ba based on this particular introduction, I have a whole process of questions that I'm developing and have developed. Well, let's, uh, let's just take an example. <clears throat> so one of the participants, Jill, had a business challenge. And by inviting her into this uh, dialogue, she said, I can't think creatively. I I'm not good with images. And actually, she was a CPA. So she says, I'm, I'm very uh, right brain. Okay. So she had her challenge. And I said, well, based on that magic question, if you could paint a picture, she said, I have no picture. I offered, well, does your challenge look to you if you could paint a picture is it like uh you're swinging on a swing set she said no she said i feel like i'm on a roller coaster going up and down i have anxiety and i can't sleep this and that once i heard that roller coaster that was the trigger for me to say hmm so what you're saying this looks like a roller coaster you feel like you're in a roller coaster and she said, yeah, that's it. That's it. It's like a roller coaster. That was the beginning stage that that identified based on Shone's work, that, that that was the image that was resonating for her to make sense of her particular challenge. Then through the next step, to change that particular metaphor, that image into a generative metaphor was to offer another metaphor. And as we went through the process through other questions, she said, I said, if you could see this challenge differently, what new image would you create? And she said, hmm. It reminds me of a merry-go-round. And that merry-go-round became her symbol, that image that she used. And the reason for that, that really came out of that, that was a retrospective image that she picked up because it reminded her when she was a little girl of how going on a merry-go-round was safe. It went in one direction. She could get on the merry-go-round and get off the merry-go-round. And so that was the cow that became her generative metaphor that she then used between interview two or interview one and interview two to frame her challenge. So by using that imaginative frame, she was able to, when that challenge popped up or she was dealing with it, she looked at that particular challenge through that frame. That's what picked up on the second interview of the change in her perception, self-awareness, 
her uh, feeling towards that particular challenge. So by this series of questions in between that, that's what changed it into that. Does that help you answer? Yes, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we could talk offline, but this just, you know, you know for this particular thing, there's a lot of series of questions, really yeah. using coaching questions, the what questions sure. that kind of opens that dialogue. So, but it is the co-creative process. So what I'm doing as the coach is I'm in the process with her. I'm just not looking for her particular metaphor. She didn't have a metaphor, but she had it. But I was able to bring that out. But the second metaphor she jumped, that became this something resonated. Now that that could have been, like I said, that was something that went back retrospectively that she had picked up in her lived experience that she identified with. Others did not. Others created something completely different. Um, so that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Richard, I have a question to Mary Jean. Um, yes. what, where are you going after this with your research findings? Um, are you moving forward with uh, developing uh, some programs for other people? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'll go to this slide. So yes, I have, I'm very fortunate um, to align with an MCC coach I've been working with for probably well, two years now, who has a coaching training company. And mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate to also have the Metaphor Coaching Domain and Metaphor Coach. So I'm turning this into a coaching process to train <clears throat> other coaches and educate coaches on how the process works and what questions to ask. Um, I think what's unique about this process is that it's just not cookie cutter. Yeah, there's a framework. There's a series of questions. But in essence, it's really getting involved in that co-creative process to really listen and have presence with the client because this could be used just as a process itself. If somebody is looking at opportunity or facing a challenge, but it also could be part of an actual coaching overall coaching process or framework that coaches can use when they hear clients and they say, I have this challenge, how do I deal with this? So that's where I'm going with this over the next uh, six months. And I'm actually doing my first webinar that's gonna go further into detail on this particular model in this process with uh, other questions. So just to kind of hear it with, with this uh, coming in March. But, but I think the challenge has been for myself within this process is that it's sort of unique, but we all use metaphors as coaches. I mean, it's, it's used heavily. And I said, no, wait a minute. There, there has to be a way through a series of questions. And that's what I really have been working on for two years. It's been really daunting sometimes, but I think by doing the research and I've had a great committee uh, to help me through that process, um, both to challenge myself and to understand, but I think by allowing the process to happen naturally with an overarching framework can really help clients make sense of what's going on with their particular challenge, but also they can take that next step to say, hmm, maybe I can solve this. Maybe I can look at this differently. So that is the next step over the next uh, six months. Anything else you wanna to add to that or question? Oh, thank else? you, Jean. That was a great question. Um, are there other questions from the group? Yeah, one, Richard. Mm -hmm. uh, metaphors are great. So let me ask you about when you're dealing um, with culture, somebody that comes from another country has looked at things in a different way because of the cultural and their diversities that they have with metaphors. We're all human, I understand that, but they they perceive it a different way or they perceive it a different way. Yeah, that's a great question. That was one of the questions I brought up. I, I researched the literature on that. And what I found is that the human race uses metaphors, images, really every six minutes. I mean, we use metaphors really, it's just a part of our language 
to help us make sense of reality. Uh, but it's only a slice of reality. So cultural wise, there was nobody in this particular research and I have uh, probably down the, the road as, as a separate research uh, project is fine. Is there a cultural difference? What I found through the literature, there really is not in a way that yes, they may interpret it differently, but images that we all create is what we use in order to help us make sense of the situation we're in. So it's not based based upon maybe Lakoff and Johnson's work where there's sort of embedded metaphors, what we call embedded you know, metaphors that become part of our language of culture, uh, say in the West or would be a different metaphor or the same particular situation. What Schoen does is Schoen takes it and says, okay, I'm not just looking at metaphors. I'm taking metaphors through the lens of a known image and changing it to an unknown image that had not been seen before or known before. So that's the nuance or the difference between the two is that it's not an embedded metaphor that could be in one culture, but means something in another culture. It's really identifying individually what image somebody uses initially, but by changing that to a generative image, that creates a different uh, process that they can use in order to help make sense of their particular challenge. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it, and that was a great question because I had that same question for myself is that if it's done here, but it's really, and, and there's even uh, literature, they talk about dead metaphors, metaphors that might have been interpreted a certain way at one time in history are now interpreted completely different. So there's a, a whole process of dead metaphors or embedded metaphors. And, but, but the biggest thing with embedded metaphors is that we use certain metaphors in our cultures, uh, such as time is money uh, mm -hmm. is one. That may mean something completely different to somebody in a whole different culture, exactly. which, which it would, right? Okay. So exactly. That's when I first started. I said, well, is there really something here? And just by, by going through this, and it really was Schoen's work. Now, I had heard of Schoen's work before. I've heard of generative metaphor. But when I joined in, a, in really a coaching process and just saw that there was this iterative process. So if you look at, at Schoen's work, the, he, that, it, that, that process he uses himself is iterative. It's starting with one image, but changing it to a different image. So, and metaphors themselves are images, even though it's like, we sometimes use it's like this, or I feel like, or it looks like. By changing it to an unknown image, it's really a, you know, some way to kind of give us a slice of reality, but it's not reality. So let me just back up to that. In all of these participants, their challenge had not changed within that four to six week process, or but I think it was eight weeks total between the first interview and the second interview. Their business challenge had not changed at all, but they saw it differently because they imagine it differently. And by imagining it differently, their neuroscience, their brain doesn't know reality from not reality. The brain, oh, so by looking at that challenge through that new generative metaphor, they were able to look and feel differently and perceive it differently that they can now take action uh, with that. But I think the most exciting part was they had really the head, heart, and gut. I think back one of the previous questions, what am I going to do? I, I don't know. I was challenged on that by my committee that that itself may be the really the framework here, that there's something going on within really the head, heart, and gut yeah. that has not been seen before. I, I haven't found any yeah. literature on that that's fascinating. Uh, just really, that that to me is just really an untapped area. So Richard, I see Kristen hand up. Kristen, um, go ahead and take yourself off mute and you can ask your question. Great, thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back to the example you gave. I think the client name was Jill. Yes, Jill. With the, um, the merry-go-round and the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. So I was really struck by what you described as how the frame and the picture change. You can have a change in frame, but you're still working with the same picture. And in this process, both of those change. And so what I was wondering was if you could unpack that example a little bit more with those two metaphors to understand in that instance, what 
what is the frame? What's the picture? And is the generative metaphor, which I understand to be the merry-go-round, was that the frame? Was it the picture? How, how do those pieces all fit together in that example? Yeah, that's a great question. So if we look at it from the first uh, image was the roller coaster. That became the frame and the picture that she identified Jill, the participant, as trying to make sense of her particular challenge that she was encountering. By then using the iterative process of co-creative dialogue and creating the generative metaphor, the generative metaphor became the new frame and the new picture. So what we see there is we see a shift from the frame and picture she was using initially and by changing that through the process, she now created a new frame and a new picture. The new frame and the new picture, by being invited into the generative metaphor framing process, that allowed her to have that shift in feeling, perception, awareness, and perspective. So what I picked up on that, I said, hmm, if I could take a step back and look at really all this research and the findings, is this process actually creates a new frame and a new picture. And so we now have shifted something unique where we're not just holding on to one frame with the same picture and trying to work that and say, well, okay, if we can make change because we could change the frame. And, and really when we're, you know, as far as changing the frame, we can either expand the frame of that same picture of the roller coaster. I could talk about the roller coaster. How do you feel on a roller coaster? What, what, what image is a roller? I mean, that, that's a whole coaching process there, but by staying there, it doesn't shift the frame and the picture. And by working with the new picture and the new frame, that merry-go-round helped her make sense in a new reality. That new reality opened up something that she had not seen before, felt before. So that's kind of where the differentiation becomes. Now, I didn't pick up any of the of the literature of really even Schoen's work. If that picked up, I picked up that Schoen said that this would create a new perspective or new possibilities uh, for a situation or a challenge and also new solutions. So there's sort of this kind of process there. What I saw is something where it even created a new perception. Does that help kind of clarify or I guess what, what other questions you have with that? Yes, that was perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So Richard, I'm sitting in a question and it, it kind of piggybacks on what Chris just asked. I think I'm still wrestling with the distinction. Is there a distinction between the frame and the picture? Or are the is the frame around the picture just part of that picture? Um, and I, can you help me understand that a little bit more? Yeah. Sure. If we go back to the uh, Jill, I, I guess, uh, example. So the roller coaster is the image that she initially started with, metaphor image. That particular picture is the picture that she saw, her challenge. Metaphor is also a frame and a frame is a metaphor, meaning that a metaphor is a framing device and a frame can also become a device to frame a picture. So by shifting that to a new frame, hence a new image, the image became a new frame. So we have sort of this separation between the initial metaphor that was also framing her particular picture, but then the picture became the new frame. And by shifting that frame, she was able to retrospectively go back to something that she remembered as a child, which is the merry-go-round, that, that's what clicked for her. But also by using the merry-go-round, it became the prospective frame for her to see her challenge imaginatively through a new frame, hence a new picture. So there's sort of a play on that. If we go back to Bateson's, uh, you know, Bateson's work, 
where what's inside the frame we evaluate and if we reframe the frame we're only reframing the picture whether we take a landscape approach or we take another slice of the same picture what this process does is it actually changes the frame and the picture but by changing the image it also changes the frame so there's sort of a play on that if that can maybe clarify but certainly ask the further detail on that no oh, thank you are there other questions or thoughts around this um <coughs> a complex yeah, that, was, that was that was confusing it still is a bit confusing for me when it, you change the you change the picture ch changes the frame I, I i still don't that doesn't settle right with me i just need to think about that but i was thinking more like the frame <clears throat> You know, what you're saying is really fascinating to me, but the idea that the frame or the picture or the metaphor of the roller coaster is held by the perception. And I, as I think about frame, I, I think you mentioned it was a heuristic, mm -hmm. the way you're going to approach it. And so it's kind of like having a set of glasses. Mm -hmm. And so if you change the glasses, you still see the same picture, the same challenge. But now the glasses make you think about the picture in a different way. But I still think about the question I had for you was um, everything is on the outside as you look at a, a challenge, a business problem, whatever. Uh, my question was, how do you get people to think about <clears throat> when you're coaching in this co-creative metaphor, this regenerative perception to take it from the outside, the, the externals to the inside, how they personally relate or interact with this new challenge. And do you find people in their head, heart and gut thing, shifting the way they see themselves in this context? Hmm. Yeah, let me kind of <clears throat> unpack um... There's a, there's a lot there. I mean, that's no, okay. No, let me just, no, it's great. That's why we're, that's why, well, we're co-creating here, right? We're, we're talking right. out loud. So I, I'm open to, absolutely. I think it's fascinating as I, I mean, went through this. Go ahead. Um, so let me go back to the, to the frame. So in essence, the challenge itself is the challenge. That, that's a particular frame, right? So that's a frame. What, what I'm not doing is trying to focus on the challenge that is more of a traditional or goal focus okay so we got this challenge i did it okay how can we solve it what what ways can we look at it differently or you know what actions can we create for you to solve this problem mm -hmm. this challenge. what the essence of bateson's and shown's work is that i took the image the first metaphor that's the frame, that becomes the frame, not the challenge is the frame. I'm saying that the frame, that the image that was created, the initials back to Jill, the roller coaster, that framed a picture of a roller coaster that she was using to help her make sense of her challenge. The generative metaphor framing process takes that initial picture that is framing that challenge and creates a new image, which is a new frame because it's a new picture with a new frame. So it leaves behind the roller coaster and brings that person to shift and look at their challenge through, through this particular frame of the merry-go-round, which then internally, if we see the findings, it helped create that shift in their perspective internally However they did it, whether they look back retrospectively or prospectively, they're using that nuance. And that's a whole nother study is that, but it is changing something internally because there was a change in the feeling they had towards their particular challenge, but also the perception of the head, heart, and gut. Prior to that, and I have certainly we can go offline and, and send you the details. You could see all the questions, all, all the outs, all, all the information that came out of that was Jill said, um, I feel like, you know, my heart's over to the side and my head is just out there. There was a misalignment, but by changing that initial metaphor 
and framing it through the merry-go-round, she was able to have that shift in perception and have alignment within Who's her says? head and gut. Hello. So I'm well. I'm well. Thank you for asking. Yes, I'm here. I'm here too. Hello. Um, Hello, so as, so as far as we're changing the frame, so I'm not saying we're going to. Everybody there? Hello. Yeah. Go ahead. Richard. I think okay. I was able to mute that person. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's I thought it was. I thought it was talking to me at first. But, um, so it's not reframing the challenge, and and maybe this is the nuance here or the difference is that it's not saying okay, let's, but it is reframing the challenge but it's reframing that metaphor, the initial metaphor. And so the metaphor that was initially created of the roller coaster, that is what is reframed. And that's where the new frame with a new picture creates the findings in this research. So there's, there's multiple layers here. I think it's what, uh, you know, is interesting. Does that kind of open up a little bit more for you to think about? It's helping me think. It, it shifts it back to me as I'm thinking about coaching, um, thinking about how you help people uh, perceive themselves as in their perception of their challenge. And so what, you, what you've what you done is you've helped me understand uh, there's a shift in perception, mm -hmm. but it's not just the perception I'm, about the challenge. It's, it's like Jill may be afraid Mm -hmm. of going on that roller coaster and the challenge may be overwhelming that she feels inadequate or pure or just can't do it that that fear shifts when she says now i can do this merry-go-round mm -hmm. and so as i can if i can create a, a way of thinking about this challenge in a way that i can manage and move into it to address it something inside of her shifts from fear to saying okay i'm willing to i'm willing to go in and and that is it's the internal shift that interests me and there's your 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 heart your head and your gut um has to do with your feelings and your thinking your head and your and your image of how you see yourself uh, that for the coaching part that's what's interesting how do you take someone who's afraid or overwhelmed or when you have insurmountable challenges, shift that belief that she, he or she can go into this. And so it's a, it's that co-creating that the co-creator herself is being developed, uh, growing. No, I think you hit, no, this is exactly where I, I, I think exactly correct is that let, let, okay, let me add to that, back up to something. Instead of what, what traditionally I would do was say, and especially in coaching, there's a whole school of thought on this. And this comes out of uh, David Gross work on asking clients how they feel about a situation or, you know, how, you know, how do you feel? That's, just, I mean, it's a loaded question, right? So yeah. I came through a different route by Knowing and back to the background, every client, we all have this emotional connection to a challenge or an opportunity. It's, it's uncertain. We're kind of either afraid or we're apprehensive. And so what, by, by using the generative metaphor framing process, it changes the emotional connection yeah. to a particular challenge. And, and here's where I wish I would have put it up, but just to kind of give you what came out of that finding in the second interview each of these individuals, these are the actual quotes that they use, a sense of connection that they didn't have before, a sense of a total, a, a total body thing, a, a sense of alignment, a sense of wholeness. So something shifted internally, internally. that they, even though their challenge had not changed, I, right. And, right? We didn't frame the challenge differently. Say, well, you know, look at your, we framed the picture that they initially saw, which was say with Jill was the roller coaster that was set aside. And she was able to replace that through an imaginative frame that created a new reality that she had not known before 
and felt before, but now she could actually see the challenge through this merry-go-round, which shifted something internally. And I think you're right, is that there was a shift in her fear. I think she said on the one after where she said, well, you know, after I, I wasn't up all night thinking about this. Well, that shows some sort of emotional connection. She had a shift. And I think hers was, she had a sense of completeness, if I remember just looking at it. So she had a shift where she felt complete. She, she felt something shift inside her that she had not had before. Now, if I would have stayed with the roller coaster metaphor, that image, how would she been able to shift? And that's where Schoen's work comes in by changing the known image that she first created into a new, a new unknown image that was able to reframe through a new lens of what her initial feeling was with the roller coaster image with her challenge. And, and that's, that's a whole nother research. I, I think as I go forward to kind of see that is there is a shift that's happening through this process. But if we only stay with one metaphor, the initial metaphor, how does it change anything? To me, it's like, okay, how do we, and, and this goes back to the two different schools of thought. Do you only use what the client metaphor? Let, let's say that she gave me that metaphor and we stay with that. How would that have shifted in a certain way based on this research? Or if I was the coach and said, well, I'm going to say, I think you're dealing with this metaphor and this is the one you're going to deal with. Well, how did that solve it, right? But that co-creative process brought out, a, and there was actually one particular um, participant. We started with three different images until, and I went back and just that iterative process until he came up with one, uh, just an example. I, I actually live outside of Philadelphia and there's a place called Rittenhouse Square and if anybody knows about it, um, which is a, it, it's a park that has several different entrances that you can go in and out. And he just blurted out, it feels like uh, central, uh, this, this place in Philadelphia, um, you know, the, the park. And that, whole, that opened up a whole series of unpacking that information where he said, I can go in and out of either entrance, uh, not feel stuck. That was his, that became, and that's what he used it to frame his challenge he created that picture. But if we would have stayed with his first initial metaphor or image that he created, or if I only threw out a particular image, how would he have made that shift? And that's, that's really what this shows is that somehow a shift was made that he had not had before. But just saying, okay, well, I use metaphors in coaching. Okay, well, we all do. But how do we take the metaphor and how do we change the metaphor? And that's where Schoen's work comes in and Bateson's work by framing that particular new image, we can now look inside that particular frame and evaluate that frame to see if that frame can help in any way. And that's what we see here. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, 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 I think about several people. I've, I've been able, didn't realize that was happening, but that's, that's exactly what was happening. Um, I was working with a Japanese student who's father said you will study computer science and that was the only avenue open to her <clears throat> and when she came to talk to me about uh, she she didn't want to be a computer scientist her image of herself was i don't like this at all and, she, and then uh, but she had no other choice in that in her family uh -huh. and then as i was listening to her and i was poking around and trying to listen to options that what her other interests were, and we were using the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I, I happened to look at uh, a list of jobs and I was asking about um, her interests. And then I, I looked down at one, I said, well, this sounds strange. Um, talking about various other occupations besides computer scientists. I said, have you ever thought about using your computer science I said, have you ever thought about working in the, um, as a police? And she, she threw herself back in the chair and she says, I've always wanted to be in, uh, working with the police, but my father said, no, 
you've got to be a computer scientist. I said, well, have you ever thought about using computer science, uh, working in computer science in the police force? Mm -hmm. And combining those images opened up a whole new frame for her to see her education and solve the issue with her father and to move on to a career path in which she did. She actually went into the police work. But she was stuck in one one lane mm -hmm. until it was that image was opened up and broadened. That that's what I think the co-creative thing that she 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 saw, yeah, that I could do that. Absolutely. I mean she owned it. When she owned it, there was there was the shift, there was the emotion, and then then there was motivation for the computer science, and then there was motivation to make a contribution in in her and in, in develop her career absolutely yeah so. yeah so you helped her reframe so it, it, images as we, as i said we speak in images constantly but we see life as images i mean these are so she saw herself one way because that's the way she was framed to look at reality that way and you helped her consider other options so i think this technique i mean as a whole as coaching is about this process I've, I've specifically pinpointed using metaphor as an actual device in order to take a challenge, but working with the metaphor and working with metaphors, to create a new metaphor. And then we, so that helps us make sense. It kind of says, okay, because we, we ask ourselves, what's going on here? We have all this information and we tend to, through Carl Weeks work within sense making as an ongoing process, we retrospectively, we go into our unconscious of past lived experience and say, okay, is anything in my past like this? And even Carl Weeks talks about metaphors are a way that we use. We use metaphors to try to help us make sense or images, right? In order right. to do that. And we also then retrospectively will use another image or a metaphor to try to make sense or bring it together to say, oh, no, it's like this. So that's when we use a, uh, I feel like this, when the person would say, I feel like I'm in quicksand. Well, that, that's the metaphor we're trying to help us make sense of it. But what I'm saying within my research, if we stay stuck in that image, we're stuck. We may not be stuck, stuck, but we're stuck in a way. So as a coach, how can we change that particular initial image for them to now take another step forward or back, whatever it may be, to look at it differently and to see that through a whole different lens, which is not reality. It's, it's, it's a new reality, but it's an imaginative reality. It's an alternative reality. But we do that constantly through our, through our lives every day to try to make sense of reality. Right, right. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and Richard, some, you know, something that's coming up for me, and, and this is something I do in my practice, is you know, when a client throws out a metaphor, and, and we'll go back to the roller coaster, you know, roller coasters and, and merry-go-rounds, you know, as a coach, I might add, you know, they're, they're still circular. They're still coming right back to the place they started. Yes. The other thing I notice as a coach, or as your coach, I might say, and here's the other thing I've noticed about this metaphor or that metaphor, and I think when we offer up our assessments of the metaphor, that we are creating a generative process without asking them to create a new metaphor. And so I think there's some lovely ways that we can just even react. You know, when they say quicksand, I'm like, well, how, you know, I know we're not trying to stay with the original metaphor, but our reaction to the original metaphor um, and how that serves the client or doesn't serve the client or it, it, how it serves the situation or doesn't serve the situation is something I think that can be really valuable. Um, and I am noticing, um, just by the way, Richard, you have no pictures in your presentation. And since you're doing metaphor, I think you should have some visuals, especially the merry-go-round and the roller coaster, because that could be a really lovely way of trying to really help create clarity around um there's some challenges here i think in in teasing out some of these nuances but one of the questions i wanted to ask was do you ever with your clients use images which i think are different than metaphors to help generate 
the metaphor. So like pieces of you cards or visuals from Center of Creative Leadership. I'm curious if you've used that those types of tools in your practice. Uh, no, I talk about that in my uh, actual dissertation. There is a study that uses cards uh, with that. And I think when I found with that is they create a particular uh, it sort of closes it off. Yes, it could be a catalyst, right, as an image. But if we go back to Schoen, what, what we're using as Schoen's particular theory is that a metaphor is an image. And so to me, based upon what I interpreted within that study, uh, I forget the study offhand, is that it sort of limits just like only using a client-generated metaphor or a coach-generated metaphor it sort of closes off that yeah. um, process uh, to allow that co-creative process uh, to work. Uh, but no, I have not worked with it, but I know people who do, and I have it in my dissertation that I bring that up and where that differentiation comes, uh, comes in. But just to make an offering on your one particular, I agree, there are ways, just, just the metaphor itself, if you work with the initial metaphor, you could find, and that's where I, really part of the process and the questions is kind of really unpacking what that metaphor means to that individual, that particular client. And then you can then offer the alternative metaphor by using Schoen's work is saying, hmm, how can we shift that? Because it's just being curious if, if we're assuming and not assuming, but saying, hmm, because if they're only resonating with that current metaphor, but I agree with you, if unpacking that, that is part of the process kind of identifying what does it mean to them? What does it look like, sense like? Uh, that absolutely, I think it's even just that initial metaphor, that, that is loaded within itself. I think back to the one gentleman asked it, back to Jill, there was fear, anxiety she had. Um, but as far as within the dissertation, I was not trying to coach. And that was the big thing within my committee. I couldn't offer, I couldn't coach. And they were told, I'm, this is not a coaching session. So I had to be very careful just to do it from a dissertation, from a research perspective. But within my coaching practice, I ask those questions. So back to you, I mean, you picked up on a you know, great point. I, I unpack that initial metaphor as deep as I can go. Yeah, thank you for creating that distinction and you're right. When we as coaches engage in the research, um, it's really hard to <laughs> yeah. that coaching hat and stay in the mindset of researcher. So I could see the challenges that that would have created. I know I had that same experience is that, but I wanted to follow up and ask those really great, thoughtful oh. questions. And and you, we have to stay with that researcher mindset. And so thank you for making that distinction. I think that's yeah. important. Yeah, but you brought up a valid point because it was frustrating. I really, yeah. <laughs> oh, why? I mean, I, but I, I had, I don't know if anybody knows uh, Fred Steyer, but he was, really, I had to really, really guard my, I had to put the guardrails on that and had to, I had to tell people this is not a coaching session. And they, they understood that. But, but yeah, it was difficult. <laughs> yeah. Are there other questions or comments from the audience? Yeah. I had a comment. Um, I was just thinking about, how you get clients to that place. And I thought this approach lends itself best to a triadic approach, like through marriage coaching, mm. where there's three parties. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I say three parties because it's in that um, third party that the client can engage in that dialogue or be invited into that dialogue right and i'm thinking when there isn't you know a third party or that triad i'm thinking the other way that you could get that client to that shift is to encourage opportunities for that dialogue to occur which can be you know, audio books on self-help mm -hmm. or um, in dialogue, even with their confidants, family or friends who then help over the course of that coaching um, arrive at those dialogues. But they have to be, they have to be willing to um, 
go there, which, which I'm not sure is if they're extending the invitation or they're inviting the invitation. But in any event, there's an invitation that's occurring that, that with that new information that's co-constructed in that dialogue with that confidant, mm -hmm. that that shift then can, can occur. I'm thinking. Let me, let me just say, yeah, I think it's an interesting perspective. I'm curious, is it like gestalt there? I mean, that's where I, I do pull a little bit from gestalt therapy here and that using, when I talk about co-creative is that that's that third space and almost becomes sort of the talking to the chair. It's the third, it's part of the triad. Um, that I think as part of this process is that you're basically inviting them into this third space that you're both co-creating or filling with information. I'm taking from the client what their particular aspects and I'm contributing to that. And that's where that inner subjective sense-making comes into play. I'm, make, I'm making sense of the particular process of what they're talking about, but then I'm trying to make sense of what their sense-making or making sense of what they're trying to make sense of. But that third space using Gestalt therapy is having them talk to the actual uh, metaphor or the, you know, the uh, new image, that could be part of a third uh, process. But I think you're talking about using a third party after taking this particular process and you're saying, then use that metaphor with, I guess, sharing with that individual, just so I understand, just help me with that. No, I, I think um, that third place could be It's, it, it results in the invitation to that dialogue, okay. which then helps that client make that shift on their own that they mm -hmm. then might bring back to that next coaching session that helps them re-envision the new image mm -hmm. and then accept or move toward that. Yeah, that's, in, that, that's very insightful. Yeah, and I'm wondering too, Richard, when you were doing your research, you know, I love what you said earlier, like we use a metaphor every six minutes, I think you said, or we're, yeah. we're using yeah. different language. I, I, actually, it's every six seconds, I follow. Yeah, I have the I have this thing in my list. It's actually every six seconds, we actually use some type of metaphor or image about reality. It's just something we have in our language as humans. And so I think as coaches, really listening with that distinction in mind because I, I imagine in myself even you know being in a coaching session our language is dripping with it and are we listening for those drips and are we able to bring attention to those different metaphors in a way that serves the client because our language is just so laden with it that we might miss some really important metaphors that the client themselves are missing and when we draw attention to it we're creating alignment and awareness um this isn't necessarily what you did in your research, but it's calling back into practice and how we um, don't just listen for the issue or the situation, <laughs> yes. but what is the metaphor that would suggest the mindset of how they're being? If I could just uh, make an offering with that, that's after coming through this process, I know it's with the ICF, we listen. I listen with such intense, not, you know, over, but just listening because it can come in any coaching conversation. This is, this is a particular process that is used as either as a one-off or as part of a coaching relationship. And part of my dissertation is that I did this during COVID. I, I did this during the heat of COVID is that once the generative metaphor was created, I asked in the second interview, I didn't include it in here, but I can send it separately is that I said, using this new generative metaphor, such as Jill with the merry-go-round, how do you perceive or what, what percent, I forget the exact perception of how COVID is impact. And that was able to show that a generative metaphor that was created in, a, in the first interview could be used in other particular challenges. So the generative metaphor became generative itself meaning that it helped her see her see COVID in a whole different frame. So that's, that's a whole nother part of the research that was unique in itself. So 
it's I think it becomes where this image sort of almost became embedded that she had begun to use or could use in other particular challenges. And I think that's where using this particular process, you don't have to create a new image every time is you could work with the image that they currently have. But if you sense the client is stuck with that metaphor or they're just not moving from that, there's still a lot of emotion. And you ask that question, what is your head, heart and gut sensing with this? And if you still pick up, uh, I feel disharmony or there's not alignment or I feel heavy in my heart, you know that you need to introduce a new metaphor through inviting them into this generative metaphor framing process because you know there's misalignment. And so that current metaphor they're using to help make sense is not working. And that's what this does is it's not just, okay, here's a cookie cutter framework. That's, that's that co-creative dialogue, knowing when to offer that you as a coach sitting in the middle and you're not just saying, well, I only have to use the client, you know, the client's metaphor, but also as a coach, I'm just saying, well, I think this is the metaphor you should use. It is that understanding and that perception and being present and listening to what your client needs when they need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Richard, you just put um, a question in the chat. Um, she's curious about exploring generative somatics within generative metaphors and coaching. And how have you seen that blend work? Yeah, that's something I'm, uh, I've been looking at because that's a whole nother, I tell you, within, within organizational development, which was my degree, was uh, you have a kind of method being used called generative imagery, where um, that can also change the organization and how they see itself and how they can change that and create meaning or actually meaning making. The generative somatics is really, I think where the head, heart and gut is where I'm going with that. Because that shows something is happening physically with that individual to perceive the world around them differently. And by doing that, there's an incomplete different person, not I mean different person, but they're sensing reality differently than they had before. And that really, to me, is a modality unto itself that, that really has tweaked my interest. And that's why I even brought it up, that I think there's something integrative there. Uh, but that is a part of what I'm looking at. And whoever that asked that question would love to talk offline of what they know. We can explore a little further together what, what their perspective is on that. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. We probably have time for maybe one more question, if anyone um, is sitting in one. Okay, well, Richard, I just, I just, oops, a little bit of an echo there. I want to thank you so much for your time and for your scholarship and for sharing your research with us. I can sense that there's more calling you. <laughs> it's called, thank you. It's calling. Yeah. Something. Oh, oh, no, I thought it was done. Yes. Not done yet. That's uh, just the beginning. The universe is calling, I know. The universe is calling. But part of the next step is, is we do this amazing research that's heart and gut and soul work. Um, we need a place to continue to share it. And so, um, I'm delighted that you have that place here. The session is recorded and will be available in the attendee hub until I think mid April. So for those who want to come back to some of this, um, you, you can. And again, uh, we will be issuing continuing education units through the ICF for this session. And again, Richard, thank you for your time and expertise. This was a wonderful generative conversation. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate the opportunity to learn from you. No, I thank you. And I'll just close with that. So if anybody needs to get the PDF of all of all the research behind it, you can send it to uh, Richard at metaphorcoach.com or any kind of uh, correspondence be more than happy to continue the conversation. So thank you. I appreciate everybody. Thank you. All right. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.